Hello, everybody. Welcome along to the Event Industry News Podcast. The podcast is kindly supported by Visit by GES, our smart event solution partner. For more information on Visit by GES and its smart event solutions, head over to visit.ges.com. Uh, as always, a very good morning, afternoon, or evening to our podcast followers wherever or whenever you may be tuning in from. Uh, stay up to date with all of the latest content from eventindustrynews.com by downloading the Event Industry News app available for all the major mobile devices. And uh, you can also follow us on Twitter, as always, at Event News Blog is the handle to use for any tweets over to us. Um, now, on with today's episode, we're going to be looking at some of the current trends within the event industry and the tech that's being used. And I'm delighted to say that joining the podcast for the first time is Tom Vamos, Digital Development Manager at Freeman. Tom, thank you very much for joining the podcast today. No, thank you for having me. Um, in a nutshell, let, let, let's put things in context first of all, Tom. Tell us a little bit about Freeman and also your role at Freeman as Digital Development Manager. Sure. So Freeman uh, is an incredibly large American organization that specialize, or have done until recently, specialize essentially in exhibitions and huge events. And they, they have about 7,000 employees worldwide. And uh, we're working essentially in sort of the logistics of exhibitions, huge fleets of lorries, they'll build you anything, they'll manage everything you need on site. But relatively recently, have looked to branch out far more into um, a digital delivery for their, their current exhibition clients. And they set up a fund called Digital Ventures and said, let's get going in the world of digital. Uh, and so uh, myself and other people have been brought in. And my role as a digital development manager, I run uh, two teams of developers working on a couple of core products, the uh, show plans product that uh, gives you a virtual exhibition floor. So mm -hmm. having lighting here, it gives you a virtual exhibition floor and helps um, uh, event organizers to uh, manage their stand space in their exhibition floor as best as possible, as well as Exhibition Architect, which is a uh, exhibitor manual that also then works with our floor plans technology. So Freeman looking to uh, break far heavier into the world of uh, digital delivery within events and exhibition space. Um, and uh, do not adjust your screens, everybody that's watching the video of today's podcast. The, today's podcast is being brought to you with added psychedelic wallpaper. I'm not in my usual uh, usual recording location. Um, so forgive anybody who's adjusting the contrast on their screens watching this video. Um, Having said what you've just said about um, digital ventures, about Freeman making deliberate plans to bring on uh, uh, teams of people to actually look specifically at this subject, mm. let's start delving a little bit into, I suppose, what we're loosely calling trends, both for event organizers and the operation side of things and the tech that's being used at events. So if we begin, first of all, I suppose, with the organization and the operation side of things, what are you working on at Freeman and what are we seeing in the industry at the moment as a, as a tech trend? So we're, we're very much uh, here in Freeman, or in, in my particular bit, very much focused on the exhibition floor and the show plans that are involved there. And this comes out in kind of, that's, this manifests itself in kind of three ways. So we can create a beautiful delegate experience where on a website or within an app they can uh, maneuver around a sort of 3D version of the exhibition floor prior to visiting or indeed when they're there tapping on various stands and they can read about the exhib exhibitors who are at those stands and learn a little bit more about them, bookmark it and, and the such like. But that's actually kind of a, a rather happy byproduct of, of a set of tools that really enable the event organizer prior to the event to start designing their floor space, to get the most of their floor space, in fact. Uh, we have some quite nice algorithms allow us to say, work out where we can still have people moving around very efficiently on the floor, but we can squeeze a bit more uh, exhibi sellable exhibition space into the area if required. Um, and then we have sales tools available to allow people to start actually selling the space uh, accordingly um, on, on, on the floor space. And then the third element of it is, of course, that we can have nice sort of technical uh, printouts and te bit technical uh, specs generated out of the software that allow the people who actually have to build it to know height restrictions, where the ducts are, where the no-build zones are, where the fire escapes are, and that kind of thing. So that, that's, from my point of view, what, what I'm focused on the most in Freeman at the moment. I'm curious then, just, just going to, to something you just said, movement of people within spaces, because um, a lot of people who are, are, are watching and listening to today's podcast will have seen um, technology of some description that allows them to plan a given 
floor space, either an exhibition or uh, you know, it could be even an award ceremony, something like that. Um, so we're now taking it a stage further where not only can we plan things at exhibition stands and, and put those in digitally, but you're saying you can actually track and, and analyse where people may move within those spaces and how best to, to locate some of those stands, is that correct? No, sorry, that's not correct. No, we we're, were talking about the uh, prior to the event, the manipulation of the space to make the most of the available space. Right. When you're when you're selling your stands, and you say, "Well, I've got 10 meters squared here." Well, actually, I could probably make that 11 meters squared, or two, a five, and a six meters, etc., to take more advantage of space and still not break any rules about fire, uh, fire regulations, and, and the such like. No, we can talk about tracking later because that's an interesting area as well, and that's something that we're pursuing as well in Freeman, but not specifically in that bit. Certainly. Well, when, it, when it comes to, to that, that floor plan element, and, and we'll, we'll sort of look at this in, in a bit more detail, um, how, how, does, how do you as a company, when you're delivering those services, stay up to date with what, what the venues are actually doing? Because presumably the information that you can work with with the client is only as accurate as the information you're supplied by the venue in terms of floor plans and building schematics and things like that. How does that process generally work for anybody listening to the podcast who may not have deployed that sort of technology before? So we would get um, the most up-to-date schematic that we can from, from a venue and you know they know us, so they, they keep us in, they they keep us informed. But well, occasionally we might phone up to find out if there's more occurred, or if we have a situation where it's not actually a venue. So, for example, we had um, Country File, which was in Blenheim Palace, uh, mm -hmm. and outdoors. So we're talking a field. So you don't really have a schematic for a field. You just know where the trees <laughs> are, and you know where the lakes are, and we'll go out there and we'll sort of work out all the available space. Uh, and then we'll uh, sit down and we'll initially start off with a, with a CAD plan um, of the area with as much detail in there as possible. But once that's loaded into our software, the organizer themselves, they don't need to be uh, an AutoCAD uh, genius, the, the, the organizer themselves can carry on designing their, uh, their floor plan as best they'd like. And then, as I said, they can use it for selling purposes as well once things are in place to mark spaces as reserved. This is all in real time, so you can have various people running around doing the selling, and mm -hmm. they, as, as the stands are being sold off, that they, can, uh, they just come up in real time, so uh, they can't inadvertently sell space that's already gone. Is, is, that some, is working in the outdoor environment something that has become easier and is more of a recent development for a company like Freeman? Traditionally, would you have worked in, a, in an indoor environment, and as the technology has progressed and allowed you to sort of map and plan outdoors, you know, blank spaces in a way um, allowed you to venture into that part of, of the industry? Well, in theory, there, there, there's little difference because um, there are more restrictions, of course, when you work indoors because you have to be aware of, of height, uh, of uh, no build zones, and of safety regulations. But, but no, a actually, it's, we're just mapping where everyone's going to go. So they might be indoors, might be out, there might be a combination of the two. There might be sort of marquees and car parks as well as an exhibition space. And then we just have to make sure that all the maps are available uh, for those, or we try and draw it as one huge area if possible. So no, you, you could you could argue that um, you know, indoors outdoors is, is is irrelevant for us as long as we can give the delegate and the organizer a view of the entire floor plan, which could be outdoors. So, so we, we, we've seen that the floor plan side of things is, is, is something that presumably is constantly evolving within your organization. Um, what are some of the, the other elements that operationally you're seeing um, a lot of trends to and, and maybe even things that are receiving a lot of demand from your clients to either improve or develop further? Um, I think well, if we move away from floor plans, I mean, certainly something my American colleagues have been working on and we're hoping to get going here is... Um, Sort of more uh, voice voice controlled stuff in events. I say stuff. Right. That's a bit facile. So um, my colleagues in the states did an event uh, recently for uh, Marketo, and uh, they teamed up with Amazon, got hold of a load of uh, Amazon Echoes, wrote some specific Alexa skills, and I think they they did the I can never pronounce it wrong. The Moscone or Moscone Center in uh, the uh, Moscone Center in San Francisco. That's the one. They just had Open World yeah. there, and. Um, had about 15, 16 uh, Amazon Echo positioned all over the place, and uh, it, it was a ridiculous success. There's an element of novelty, I totally grant you, but it was a ridiculous success. It was everything was geared entirely towards the event, so it was a little bit commercial. You could walk up to one and say, "Hey, you know, why should I use Marketo?" and it would uh, give you a whole sales pitch. But equally, it was kept up to date with you know session room changes, 
or just literally depending on the location, where's the nearest wow. Alexa? Oh, Alexa, you have to start. Alexa, where's the nearest toilet? And it of course, tell you where it was. And that was curiously successful. It, it may wear off in time, but um, that was genuinely successful. Well, you say that, but with, with things like Siri, particularly on, on, on people's iPhones, you know, but people have got used to it. I, I, I for one, am a, a, I'm constantly using it to, to set timers or to set reminders whilst I'm working or, you know, to, to message somebody if I'm, if I'm working on another device. Um, and so for me, using voice control and voice activation on, on devices is something that actually is the gimmick has worn off and I use it as a genuine part of sort of day-to-day -day activities. So whilst there may be this, this gimmick in the first instance, I dare say that it is something that, as, like anything in, at events, the more we become used to it, the hmm. more it will be accepted as part and parcel. So presumably somebody could have gone up to this and asked, when is the next session starting in Hall 4 or how do I find this particular exhibitor? Yeah, no, that, that's precisely. While, while they, they weren't in a position to currently personalize the experience like an app would be, so you couldn't say to it, when is my next session? But you could certainly say, you know, what is on, what is on in Hall 4 at 12 o'clock or where is, you know, Dr. Smith uh, speak? Well, maybe not the Dr. Smith, but we could certainly ask about, you know, anything that was session specific. And you know, mm. take the mystery away from this for a bit. You could argue it's very similar to you going home now and saying to Alexa, what's, what's, you know, what's in my calendar for Thursday? You know, yeah, yeah. Not, not too different to that. It's a location, it's a timing, it's got a subject to it. But, it, but they, they wrapped it all up in a kind of, you know, event wrapper, so you could communicate it more in, a, in event style. When's the next session? Oh, well, and the next would then tell you when the next session was. What time is lunch? That old one, and it would come. And the, <laughs> they had to kind of help people out um, a little bit to get the most of it. Um, so you had some brand ambassadors around to say, hey, why don't you ask it to maybe tell you a joke or tell you more about the Marketo product. Can't deny, you know, it was a Marketo event and so they wanted to push that. Um, but yes, uh, in incredibly popular. In, in terms of the, the, the programming and the preparation that had to go into delivering that particular aspect, is that something that uh, Freeman's engineers had to go off and, and learn or was it something where you brought in people who were already skilled in the programming of that particular advice and the coding that it would require? How, how, much, how, how expensive and how much time did it actually take up to prepare them? Um, it, was, it was both. They actually got Amazon involved straight off the bat. Um, which you could argue is possibly the best approach, or maybe not the yes. cheapest, but these chaps obviously know what they're doing. And so um, Freeman worked with uh, Amazon to sort of develop the appropriate skills for Alexa for this particular event. And then Marketo, as the client, you know, obviously had some input into what kind of uh, utterances they wanted uh, Alexa to make. Um, but no, it was definitely tied in with Amazon. But you know, anyone could sign up for an Alexa developer. Uh, um, license these days and you know, that's something that's hopefully going forward we won't need to do in conjunction with Amazon uh, but for speed it would say well, let's, let's, let's go to the creators and work with them. Do you happen to know if this was the first instance where the Alexa devices specific or the Echo devices specifically in Amazon Alexa have been deployed in this context? I don't. I'd love to say we had a scoop on that, and maybe we did, but I don't. Uh, yeah. I, don't. It, well, I, I just think it would be fascinating to know if, if it was, or if this is a relatively, even if it wasn't the first time that it had been deployed, it, I guess it would still be relatively new, and speculatively whether or not Amazon have seen a, a possible opportunity here in, in making it more accessible for deployment at it, it, exhibitions and events in exactly the same way that um, it was used here. It would, be, it would be great to perhaps find out if, um, if there's any sort of further mileage and not just make it, allowing developer licenses to be, um, to be purchased and, and accessed, but mm. actually some sort of event specific applications that could be, um, could be developed. It would be great to know if it could be deployed on a wider scale on a cheaper and e an easier level. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, because, I mean, we know that uh, based on that, uh, we've got a couple of other events, again, in the States coming up, um, which, you know, enjoy. They saw, you know, the clients came along uh, uh, to the Marketo event and, and were so struck by it, they said, well, okay, and we have that at ours as well. So I know that we've got an event in December, I think, again, in, in San Francisco for a, a big-name client who was, uh, who was very much struck by it and wanted to see it there. Yeah. Well, I, I, I guess as well that just going back to the top of the episode um, yeah. when we were talking about tech that it, it is for 
uh, and at exhibitions, um, that, that represents a bit of a crossover, doesn't it? Because that is something that, from an operations point of view, you could argue is going to make the organizers' life a little bit easier because it's giving their attendees another way to interact with the content and find out what they need to find out. Um, but that is also something that is attendee-facing. Um, when we start moving down that route, um, what are we looking at at the moment in terms of um, wider tech and stuff that you're working on that is more attendee facing and is, is having an impact on the people that are actually going to these events? Well, the, the, there's, we, we, there's, I, want, I don't want to phrase this without sound, sound, sounding old school, but we obviously we, we have VR and VR is, is mentioned an awful lot, so various different guises and I'm sure mm -hmm. had a million conversations about VR, but like a lot of organizations at Freeman, we'll have VR on our stands or whichever um, exhibitors want it, and of course other people do that as well. But what we're looking at at the moment, so I'm hopefully going to see uh, within the next year or so, is just a slight variation on the on-stand VR experience. So I've no doubt you've gone onto a stand, you've been presented with a, with a headset and say, check this out, so you put on the headset, and of course you have a spectacularly interesting time, one hopes, if the, sure. content, the content is good. but and maybe what you're looking at is up on a screen, so your, your, your colleagues who you're walking around with, they can see what you're seeing. But to be honest, that's a little bit dull, eventually, for your colleagues who are waiting for you just to finish with the headset on. So what we've been starting to look at, but we haven't rolled this out yet, is to have a second camera in place so that your colleagues can not only see what you see, but they can also see you in the VR world, if that right. makes yeah, so yeah, yeah. You would, you would go into, a, a, you'd put on your headset and you'd go into a kind of green screen area where there'd be a couple of other cameras or maybe even a chap with a shoulder mounted camera who can create a sense of movement. So let's say you enter into some crazy avatar-esque fantasy world, but your, your colleagues waiting for you actually see you in that world and it's a full VR experience, so let's say you're brandishing a sword, that's fine, they can see the sword in your hand and suddenly you're going to have a whole lot more people coming to the stand watching people having an immersive VR experience, and it's a shared VR experience. So that's giving people the, the, the opportunity to view first person and third person VR, so from the person who's actually involved's perspective and also displaying the, the sort of third person, you know, looking on at, at them and how they are appearing in that virtual world. Indeed. And now, don't get me wrong, you, you'll, you can go onto YouTube and see examples of this, but they're almost all done in post-production. What we're saying is that this will be happening, this is obviously a real-time streamed experience. And of course, and when I say streamed, it can be streamed, obviously, out into the uh, great universe as well, or people can uh, use it to sort of upload a little clip and say, hey, this was me on so-and-so stand having an amazing time fighting a dragon or whatever particular VR immersive experience they had. But the whole point is that no longer are the audience limited to seeing what you, the, uh, the VR user, is, is seeing. And I think that's going to make a whole load of difference because we've, we've seen it, especially at, you know, say, automotive events where you can put on a headset and have an amazing experience walking around an engine or inside an engine or sitting inside a car. And don't get me wrong, that's fantastic, the guy with the headset on. But people are getting probably a little bit bored waiting for him. And the, yes, the screen might show what he's seeing, but that's not as interesting as seeing him suddenly in the car. Um. Uh, very, very recently, I was at um, a, a trade fair um, a, a, and, and convention that I was working at, and one of the exhibitors actually was using VR on their stand, mm -hmm. but it wasn't as a gimmick, it was because they had actually developed a virtual reality training program. So oh. instead of having, instead of, for the specific training course that they conducted, it was a very manual sort of hands-on operational thing to do with machinery and things like that, um, and training people on the correct procedures and protocols and the step-by-step -step, uh, guide that they have to follow in order to, to qualify and deliver that uh, and, and assess that machinery correctly. So yeah. instead of bringing people to site, they've developed a virtual reality way of people putting on a headset and actually being shown and talked through the procedures in a virtual reality world. So it wasn't a gimmick as such to just have on the exhibition stand for the sake of it. It was actually there because that's what they're delivering in their day-to-day -day world. Um, are you seeing at Freeman more examples of companies who are doing just that, where virtual reality is actually part and parcel of their 
day-to-day activities in whatever business they're doing and they're needing you to help facilitate that at exhibitions at events and thing uh, and, and such like not quite that though there has been an element of that what we're seeing the demand for VR is more around well, I'll give you a, a very good example so um, the, the where uh, the digital products department works we're in Farnborough where we have an air show uh, mm -hmm. every other year and during that air show yes of course there are lots of airplanes in there but we can't get an airplane into the buildings you know that that's that is slightly faintly ridiculous um, and also we can't necessarily show, go into great detail about engines etc so we are we already have a, a um, VR version of one of the jet engines I couldn't tell you which forgive me that you can then sort of put with your headset on you can walk around the engine you can touch parts it can come apart you can look inside it etc but the general principle is how can I VR enables me to have something on my stand that would just be impossible otherwise such as a jet engine or an elephant or 12 elephants you know, so that's what we're finding more is a kind of uh, be better use for it you know you're effectively augmenting that I use the word with a small a augmenting the stand with you know things virtual obviously not physical that you just couldn't conceivably have on the stand we're blessed in a way now that we have all of these very very sophisticated elements that we can incorporate into live events that all relate to tech and inevitably as the tech becomes more accessible we can deploy more sophisticated things but going back to the I suppose the sort of the bread and butter elements of it um, is the way that tech develops on the sophisticated level then having a, a an impact back on making some of the more bread and butter tasks a lot easier to to deliver and allowing you to actually con refine you know the way that people access the more the, the, the simple elements of the services that you offer well I think Yes, if, if, if I've understood you correctly, then the, some of the benefits of sophistication means that you can simply join things up easier. Mm. Uh, so I, we, we talk about Internet of Things, and a lot of people, you know, sort of just dis dismiss that because they think of you know talking fridges and toasters that order you bread, <laughs> you run out of bread, etc., which is lovely and fine. But I like, I really like the idea that you know more and more people can develop relatively. Technology is relatively in isolation, but when there comes a point that says, you know, hey, wouldn't it be great if I can make this bit talk to that bit, then suddenly that side of things has become a lot easier. So, you know, right. obviously a, a very simple example would be, you know, uh, event apps that are drawing on registration data or event apps that are, are drawing on updated hotel information because suddenly we can access, you know, hotel information or travel information. All in, and then it all just comes into one place. So without getting too techy, but because the, all these things have now have APIs, um, yeah. that allows. It just simply means we can join things up and not have to worry about it too much. Almost to the point that you can probably safely say, if your client walks into you and says, "Look, I've got um, this app, but I'd really like it to talk to our system that gives me constant updates on I don't know the levels of wine in the barrels of our vineyard," you think actually. Pretty sure we could make that happen. Not because we're amazing technologists, but because the individual companies have probably created the interfaces required just to join things up, which is just great for users. Uh, and this, 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 this may be a completely ignorant question, but um, when APIs, for, you know, for, when they first started to crop up as a as a term, when we first started to want to link platforms together and the first time I came across an API is when I wanted to link Twitter to a Facebook feed you know a few years yeah. ago and you know and integrate it in that way but is there a standardization that has crept in whereby there is a, a, a set protocol in order to allow these different platforms to talk to, to each other now well kind of uh, from a programmatic point of view there are a few so you may have heard of say restful API um, but there is no single, say, Esperanto that every single system speaks and therefore they can all join up. Mm. Uh, perhaps I'll slightly rephrase that. Maybe there is a little bit if we talk about XML and JSON because, you know, the all, most systems can generate uh, data in XML or JSON and most systems can interpret XML or JSON. So maybe there is a kind of Esperanto. But there's an even more simplistic level. Um, there are services out there that uh, do their best to try and join up systems by their own systems. Like if you've heard of Zapier or Ift, um, I don't know if, you, if you're familiar with these, but they. I'm were, afraid I'm not. No, no, no. Well, that, that's that's absolutely fine. But these are these are online services that try and join up very, very popular uh, 
very, very popular piece, um, application. So, for example, let's say you wanted Twitter to, uh, you wanted to be able to monitor Twitter, let's say you're, you're an exhibition organizer, you wanted to monitor Twitter for tweets that, about your event, and you wanted every time someone tweeted with the name of your event in it, that it would update a spreadsheet in Google, for example. And then yeah. in real time. So you'd normally have to go and get a software developer to write something like that. You could have that up and running in genuinely in minutes using if or Zapier that will just join these things together. It'll say, okay, here's Twitter. When it does a thing, will you write it to here's Google? And it will just join them up. Now, uh, I, I'm, I'm, one, I'm, te I'm a terrible one for dumbing things down, you could say putting it in layman's terms, but I suppose for the benefits of people that, that, that may not quite have the, the, the tech experience that you've got and the more simplistic brain that I've got, this sounds a bit like Google Translate or an equivalent for sort of programming language or, or you know, so software sort of language. So the information goes in one side in one form and it gets spat out the other side as a, in a form that the other bit of software or kit can understand. So it, you know, it, it, this third party is like a hub that's translating the, the language. Is that fair to say? Well, no, and I don't want to put, put, put it out. No, oh, no, no, no. Listen, if, I, if I'm wrong, correct me. I'm, I'm just trying to put it in a way maybe everyone can understand. And, and, you, and you're right to do that because I, I, I don't want to talk, get too techy. But put very simply, um, there is a service called IFT, and that, that name is, is a great example itself. IFT stands for If This, Then That. So you say, if Twitter has a, a, a tweet on it about the boat show, then what is that? Well, that is write that information to a Google Doc. And you just put it all together on the screen. And so it's amazing. just, it, it is amazing, genuine. And you can chain these up. So you could say, OK, so if someone tweets about the boat show, fine, update a spreadsheet about the boat show. And then you could have another piece of software looking at that data that's doing sentiment analysis and saying, is it, are they saying nice things about the boat show or bad things about the boat show? And you could feed that into a real-time report that says, we've had 10 positive tweets about the boat show in the last hour and ooh, five positive tweets are not so positive you know, about another event, of course not the yeah. boat show. You know, so you can just chain these things together and they're all real time. And you don't need to be an amazing programmer to do this because there are these services out there that allow you to join things up. You have to know a little bit what you're doing, but uh, the, the services out there are becoming incredibly straightforward for you know, reasonably logical technical people to put together and create you know, rather interesting real-time reporting um, you know, for their clients. And I, and I suppose that ties into what I was asking about, you know, as as the, the top end of event tech becomes more sophisticated, yes. that you know, does the more bread and butter stuff then become a lot easier? And and in a way, you've you've answered that because this to me sounds like instead of a, if a a fairly savvy event organizer, somebody that does know their way around a computer and has used various sort of different platforms before and has and has maybe done some some you know, web content updates themselves and things like that. It sounds to me like they could go and use this sort of service now and start creating more sophisticated communication methods and tracking methods of their own without then having to necessarily go to third parties to facilitate that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely spot on. And I think this is really important because it allows people, first of all, to think in terms of affordability and also just to think in a faintly ridiculous way. You know, if you want to think about, hey, you know, what happens if when people walk through the door, can that trigger an event that um, causes a tweet to automatically go out saying the 10th person has walked through the door? And people might say, oh, we need to hire a software house for that. Well, maybe you don't. You know, have the silly, crazy ideas because you might find you can, with a bit of conversation and a bit of research, put them together not too expensively. Excellent, and um, maybe maybe we'll see if we can get a link out to, to some of these services. You know, it, it would be great. Maybe if if you've got any of these sort of recommendations, it would be fabulous to maybe get some links out to our, our listeners and our, our followers um, via eventindustrynews.com and, uh, and and actually maybe direct some of these uh, links to people so they can start having a look at them. Because I guess, like anything, the more feedback you get from people and the more people you get using them, the better these services become. You know, the the, the more users there are. Well, I mean, in fact, you're absolutely right, and certainly the big boys have already recognized that this is, this is definitely going to become more and more in demand. So, in fact, Microsoft have already, well, for some time now, 
already had their own version of this. They haven't championed it too much, but it's called Microsoft Flow, and it allows you to join up a whole bunch of stuff. You know, obviously within the world of Microsoft as well. So yeah. stuff happens on Facebook, it'll update Excel, and I'm using you know, trite examples. But if Microsoft are putting a lot of money into this, then uh, you know they're not going to do these things too lightly. There's some mileage. There's some mileage. Um, we're talking today on the on the podcast to Tom Vamos, a digital development manager at Freeman, just about some of the the trends in the industry at the moment that uh, that Tom and his team of, of of programmers and developers at Freeman are, are experiencing. Um, as we sort of get into the latter stages of today's uh, podcast, Tom, um, what else can we expect to see, or, or what are the trends uh, are sort of floating around your office and in the world of Freeman at the moment that um, that we should be aware of? Um, something we're certainly looking into um, at Freeman is uh, delegate tracking and going back to the earlier point of obviously trying to join up all that information as quickly as possible. Now delegate tracking is hardly anything new, but it's it's I think it's fair to say it's had its ups and downs. You know, we've had passive RFID, which can be sometimes accurate, sometimes inaccurate. We've had active RFID, when people, which means people have badges but with huge batteries on because but that's very accurate, but then the badges look a little bit ridiculous. Um, we have beacons and such like. And um, something, uh, well, this is more my uh, colleagues in the States, but I'm, I'm out there in a couple of weeks about it, looking into um, delegate tracking via uh, Bluetooth, uh, wear, a Bluetooth wearable in the badge. So it's got right. a battery in it, but it's incredibly small. So it's about the size of a stick of chewing gum or something. You stick it on the back of the badge. Um, it lasts for days and days and days, and it allows uh, people to be tracked passively, like all these uh, delegate tracking systems do. But the receivers are incredibly cheap and small to set up because they are effectively sort of Bluetooth receivers, um, and they themselves then shoot out into the cloud whenever someone walks past saying this person's been here, or they were here for five minutes, or they're here for two minutes. If they're here for five minutes, well, then they were in a session, or they're on the stand, etc. So it's a slight, a slight, and I stress slight, rethink of the tech of uh, delegate tracking, just to make it a little bit cheaper, a little bit quicker to deploy as well. You can just sling things out, and you can sling them anywhere, of course. They don't have to be on a network, because they triangulate within the cloud. So if you did want to track someone walking up from a train station, if that were allowed, then that's fine. That kind of thing can track as well. So that's something we're we're looking to um, deploy some over the next year, as well. And it just just cheaper. It makes a little cheaper than sort of the traditional tracking experience, which is all RFID based or active RFID based. Yeah, and I was going to say I've I've seen examples, you know, where there are uh, uh, NFC or RFID chips built into um, into badges and things like that, where people have to manually touch, you know, a, a scanner or a reader. Um, either on an exhibition stand or as they're going into a certain conference or seminar session, and obviously mm. if the person doesn't touch that scanner, then you know the data is flawed to an extent because you're still relying on people manually touching uh, certain scanners and points in order to activate that data and, and make that data available. Again, if I'm understanding it correctly, with this Bluetooth technology built into the badge, this mm. is an act. Uh, this is a system that's constantly sending out, so it takes away that manual aspect of having to touch a scanner as such, which is making the data a little bit more reliable. It's certainly making it more reliable. Um, to be fair, I'll be honest with you, nothing as reliable is as reliable as someone with a barcode scanner scanning your badge. Uh, but, yeah. <laughs> but ideally, you don't want people to have to interact with other people. If you're going to use uh, technology, you know, uh, such as Bluetooth or RFID. Then you shouldn't be scanning them as well, because yeah. the whole point of having these slightly more uh, useful um, uh, technologies is that you can have a non-invasive experience, and hopefully have true accuracy. Now, I remember in the in the early days of RFID and events, um, I certainly struggled with some of the accuracy of um, of some of the system. In fact, I remember once having sort of a very a genuinely embarrassing experience with a client. I was at an event in uh, Hong Kong. And we had a CCTV alongside a dashboard of a hall. And the, the, the dashboard of the hall was telling us how many people were in that room based on the scanners. And the CCTV obviously gave us the visual. Mm. And it was so embarrassing because the, um, the hall the visuals showed us maybe 10 people milling around. And the dashboard said there's still about 800 people in there because it hadn't clocked them going out properly. That was very, very awkward. 
So a major conflicts between what's uh, what the stats are saying and what the eyes are seeing. Yes, and so that was that was very embarrassing. So I've always been very keen to if you're going to have non uh, invasive scanning. Mm -hmm then it has to be as accurate as possible. And um, from what my colleagues in the States are telling me, doing this approach, and there's a lot of configuration around this as well, you know, the accuracy is looking pretty damn good. And we just we, do, we want to really avoid that situation because the moment a client as you know, doesn't trust something once, it erodes any confidence completely in any stats and figures that subsequently follows. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely right. Um, we are running very quickly towards the end of time on, on today's uh, episode of the podcast. Um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we, we've been talking today to, uh, to Tom Vamos from Freeman um, about some of the trends that are in the tech industry at the moment, um, particularly in light of the fact that on uh, Thursday the 9th of November, Event Tech Live returns to London at the Old Truman Brewery. Um, this free-to-attend event uh, is a multi-strand conference exhibition. It's Europe's only show dedicated to event tech and has consistently grown um, since the show was launched a few years ago um, to be a real hub of activity for anybody involved in, in, in not just event tech, um, a huge amount of people from the general events industry going there now to see what's happening um, in the world of event tech as it becomes a, a rapidly uh, growing pace, a bigger part of everybody's day-to-day -day activities within the event industry. So um, keep your eyes peeled for that. And I know that uh, in a future episode of the podcast, in the next week or so, we're going to be talking to Adam Parry, one of the co-founders of Event Tech Live and the Event Tech Awards, about what we can expect to see at that event um, on the 9th of November. Um, but that brings us to the epi end, end of today's episode. Um, Tom Vamos, Digital Development Manager at Freeman, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Um, great talking to you. And as I said, it, it, we're going to try and get some of the the links and the specific information for some of these um, for them some of these platforms and services that Tom's alluded to and mentioned uh, about um, on today's podcast. Would be great to get some of our listeners and our watchers using those platforms to see what they think about them. And um, no doubt, stuff like that will then aid the wider industry as we get more people using these um, these readily available uh, services. Um, the podcast itself is supported by Visit by GES. Our smart Smart Event Solution Partner. For more information on Visit by GES and its Smart Event Solutions, head over to visit.ges.com. Don't forget to tweet us at Event News Blog if you've got any thoughts or opinions on what's happening in the industry at the moment. And don't forget to download the Event Industry News app, available for all the major mobile devices, and it will keep you up to date with all of the features, the latest content, the breaking news from Event Industry News. Dot com. Thank you very much for uh, for listening and watching today's episode. My name is James Dixon. Our thanks again to Tom Vamos from Freeman, and we'll see you next time on the podcast. Bye-bye.